Okay, so thrips. Always fun to talk about. Oh, I'm just gonna put on the light. There we go. Um, so thrips is a big topic and one I feel like I've been talking a lot about for um, the last five years. So, um, sorry, that's the dog. Uh, so I got have a lot of information up on the blog. So if you feel overwhelmed at any point in this talk that I've gone too fast about something, um, I've indicated a lot where you can find things on the blog um, as well as webinars. So just um, uh, keep that in mind if you're starting to feel like, oh, so much thrips information. So I'm sure most of you are familiar with the thrips life cycle. Um, the thing that makes it really different than other pests um, is it's got both above and below ground life stages. So biocontrol for thrips is really about getting all of those stages so none of it escapes. I'm sure a lot of you don't need a lesson on thrips damage, but basically what they do is they suck out the contents of cells um, and then they also poop out the extra contents like chlorophyll. So you get this nice streaking where they've taken out the color and then black poop on top of stuff. So not super great. This is the, what an adult looks like and these bananas are the larvae. Um, thrips are also an issue, not just because of the aesthetic damage that they cause, but also because they're vectors of disease. So things like in patients and chronic spot virus pictured here on the right. And uh, even something like tomato spotted wilt virus can transmit into um, ornamentals and make them look pretty weird sometimes. This is a modeled echinacea um, that actually had um, virus and that's why it looked like that. So here in Canada, because we have so few pesticides and so many resistant thrips coming in from other areas with more pesticides, we've developed a pretty good strategy um, on the IPM front for Western flower thrips. And, and we've come up with this infographic to help explain it to growers. So if it seems like a lot on the page, don't worry, I'm going, going to go through some of it from uh, start to finish. And also if you look under the webinars tab under the additional resources section on my on floriculture blog, there's two webinars there. One is an hour and a half long and the other one's 45 minutes. So there's lots of chance to hear me talk about thrips. Um, so it's interesting though, even though we've got this program or recipe sort of developed for thrips, um, growers still indicate it's their number one pest in recent surveys. And that's because they're still occasionally seeing failures due to thrips. So what do we mean by biocontrol failure? Well, it can mean different things to different people, but I think it generally means um, crop losses, credits back from customers, having to resort to spraying, and then what even do you pick to spray, or compartment cleanups is what I've been seeing more and more of, where growers have to resort to things being completely empty um, just to uh, get rid of their thrips problem. So why are we seeing so many of these failures? Well, there's a couple sort of um, critical points on the production timeline um, for different crops where things can go wrong. So we're gonna highlight some of those points because I don't have time to go through this whole program. But again, you can see that in other places. Um, so starting, um, so Michael decided to go ahead with thrips and we'll get back to you with mites after. Um, so this is our model strategy for chrysanthemums, for example, but it can be um, translated fairly easily to other crops. <clears throat> but one place failures happen is at cutting receipt. And I think I mentioned to you before that we know that thrips come in um, on cutting. So not only are you getting the physical thrips in, but they're also mostly resistant thrips as well. So what can we do about this? Well, so if you're not already using dips for your chrysanthemum cuttings and other plants that get a lot of thrips like Gerbera, you really need to look into this. So it's using reduced risk products that are compatible with biocontrol to basically um, suffocate and wash off the thrips. So the adults and larvae uh, when they are on cutting. So the registered products in Canada are certain soaps. Um, we've got some oils and uh, also Botanicard. Um, so the rates are a little bit lower, so make sure to check the label. The dip rates are on the label. And dipping has been shown to decrease the amount of incoming pests on cuttings by up to 70%. So it's a way of reducing your incoming pest population pressure 
so your natural enemies have more time to gain a foothold. So there is a how-to video of this um, if you look at my blog post, preventing issues in your spring crops, or if you just Google dipping, cutting dip videos, Vineland, I think it comes up as well. So the other place where failures can happen is um, complacency, for lack of a better term. So in Ontario, um, broadcasts and of mites and also starting um, with microbial applications such as Botanigard or other products that contain Bovaria is really the backbone of our THRIPS program. But that doesn't always mean these things are enough by themselves. And I, I think sometimes we get lulled into a false sense of security of, oh, I've put out my mites, I'm doing my weekly Botanigard sprays, um, I'm covered. So I'm gonna show you a bit of a case study um, from 2016 of a specific grower he was doing garden mums, and this is again where monitoring comes in. So um, he knows because he does weekly monitoring with monitoring cards that his sort of normal average for his him on his farm is around 20 thrips per card per week, um, uh, averaged out over his different areas. So that's anything above that is what Mike was saying is his action threshold, and it's. Not necessarily a threshold that can be translated to someone else's farm, but it's his action threshold. Um, so he noticed that in late June, he was getting this huge spike of thrips. Um, so one interesting thing about this also was that he did some plant taps and realized that most of the thrips were adults and he was hardly seeing any larvae. So what that means is that wasn't an explosion of thrips from his crop. It more likely meant there was a fly-in of Western flower thrips from outside because they obviously have a broad host range in other places. Um, so what he did was pivot. He knew his mite and um, botanic garden program just wasn't uh, uh, working. And obviously mites are not gonna work against adult Western flower thrips. So he shifted his strategy and he shifted to putting up tape. So again, a physical barrier um, that uh, has adult thrips stick to it. And then obviously that takes them out of the system. And he also released a bunch of aureus. Um, so the blue arrows are his release uh, time periods of aureus. And so if you look back at the original slide, this was his heavily damaged mum cutting when, um, or mum plant at the small stage when things started to, to go sideways. This is that same plants later. So it was able to grow out of the damage and even his most susceptible varieties were able to grow out of the damage and he didn't lose a single plant. And this happened for three reasons, I believe. One, because he knew what the normal was for his greenhouse. Two, he monitored for life stages and figured out, okay, I've got adult thrips, mites aren't gonna work. And three, he was able to pivot, take that knowledge and pivot really quickly. Um, so just to build on that, I'm a big proponent of mass trapping. Mike might have a different opinion, but um, I think it's useful because for every female you trap, you can potentially remove, remove 300 eggs of thrips from the system. The cons is it only really traps dispersing thrips, like I mentioned before. Uh, it can't really suck thrips out of the crop, um, but tape can be messy and it can interfere with um, some actions like pinching. Um, but you can do things to help mediate that, like um, uh, attach your mass trapping cards to string that's wrapped around your poles rather than wrapping tape itself around the poles, things like that. But I remember when I first got um, back to Ontario and took over Graham's job, I was walking through the greenhouses and knowing there was a lot of blue tape or mass trapping cards up. And I was like, that's interesting. What's this about? And uh, Graham let me know that um, research in Europe had shown that blue was much better at attracting thrips. So I, you know, took some look at the cards, but I really wasn't impressed with the numbers of thrips on the cards. So I decided to do some tests. So basically we set up um, a, some, some very large tests across several different cooperators to really test this whole yellow versus blue, especially because there's so much variation in the blue color of traps. Um, the yellow traps tend to be very much this, um, school bus yellow, although there's some patterned ones out there. And so basically what we found from this data 
was that yellow was always the most consistent, the plain yellow. If you add a pattern to it, for some reason, it's less attractive to thrips. And yellow tended to be more attractive than blue, although the blues could really vary. So some of them weren't that much worse than the best yellow, but some of them were, were pretty poor attractors. So the take home message is to use um, yellow. Um, I think also because it also attracts more pests. Um, one of the growers that I worked with that at one point was convinced that blue was, was the way to go. Once they switched to blue cards, they had to re-implement a biocontrol program for fungus gnats. And when they were using the yellow cards, they didn't have to do that. So I think there's a benefit there too. But just to show you how many thrips you can remove from your system. So 2017 was a low um, Western flower thrips year. So we were really only catching around 20 thrips per card per week, which doesn't sound like a lot, but if you add that up through a crop cycle of chrysanthemum, that's around 125,000 thrips removed and all their eggs. Um, so 2016 though, with that fly-in year we had from that previous case study, and you can see that we were getting more like 80 to 100 thrips per card per week. And this removed almost a quarter, three quarters of a million thrips removed from a chrysanthemum crop cycle. So I'm a big fan of these, um, especially if you're having any issues with your thrips control. It's something, it's a companion strategy you should be thinking about adding in. And we also did some corresponding tests with um, natural enemies that would be common in chrysanthemum. So we released Aphidias, we released Aureus, we released Diglyphus, and we really didn't find that many got stuck to the cards. Um, uh, and blue was not better than yellow in that situation. So I think there's also hesitancy to use mass trapping uh, because of that reason as well. People think they're gonna kill their bios and there's really not a lot of evidence for that. Also, just to be devil's advocate for a second, if you go back to that compatibility pesticide chart where they say losing 25 to 50% of your bios is a compatible pesticide, well, then the number of bios you're gonna use, lose getting caught on your cards is probably much less than that. So if that's an acceptable loss for you with pesticides, why wouldn't it be an acceptable loss for you with mass traffic? That's my mass trapping soapbox, which I won't get off of now. Um, so the other place failures can happen is not applying bios optimally. Obviously, every grower is trying to do this, but oversights can happen, obviously. So a big place we saw this in recently was sachets. So um, Rose Bouton House, again, at Vineland, did some research on this um, uh, about seven years ago about the proper handling and placement of mite sachets um, and how critical that is. And remember the sachets are made up, they're kind of like a mite condo. They've got bran in them and then yeast, which feeds on the bran and then cereal mites, which feed on the yeast and then predatory mites, which feed on the cereal mites. And all of that is supposed to give you this little ecosystem where predatory mites are supposed to walk out over a long period of time. And this allows you to you know, put them on the plant at spacing, and it's supposed to carry you through to sale. But if you end up putting the sachet in the wrong place, which is generally exposing it to too much light or to too much, um, uh, to not enough humidity, you get issues. Um, so for example, this orange line is the exposed sachet. And you can see that the mites sort of all walk out in the first week. And that's probably because they're so low, so low humidity here that they didn't have any cereal mites and yeast to feed on. So they all ran out and the sachet crapped out at three weeks, even though it's supposed to last more like six to eight weeks. A sachet that's nestled nicely in the foliage though and protected has a slow build up um, to the three week point, which is when you want the peak, because that's typically if you put them on at spacing in chrysanthemums, three or four weeks later, you're starting to get bud formation. That's when you want a lot of protection. And then it continued um, it's slow trajectory downward for the six to eight weeks. And again, this really has to do more with relative humidity than temperature. You can see that when the sachet is nestled nice and in, it's around 80% uh, relative humidity, but it can be as low as uh, 40 to 50% humidity when they're exposed. So this is true for where you wanna store your mites as well. Um, I think a lot of growers, uh, when they get in a box, if they can't put them out right away, they think, oh, the greenhouse is gonna be too hot. 
So they end up storing it in the office um, or even a cooler sometimes, but coolers can also be really dry. And our office space, like my house says right now that my relative humidity inside of my house is like 12. <laughs> um, so uh, what you, what's better to do if you can't release them right away, which would be obviously the optimal, is to put them in the greenhouse, but under the bench where they're protected from the sun. And it'll be more humid there. It might be a little hot. Open the box so some carbon dioxide um, can escape. And uh, uh, these recommendations definitely were, were part of um, uh, a mystery that we helped solve for a grower of why their bios weren't working that I did with both Graham Murphy and Ronald Ballantin, who some of you may know from um, years and years of his experience with bios. So that leads me to this blog post. If you want to know more about ways you might accidentally be killing your predatory mites, um, this was uh, something that um, Ronald and I worked on together. Uh, so check out this post on floriculture. Definitely a clickbaity title for ways you're killing or ac accidentally killing your mites, um, but it's got good information on that. Um, so I encourage you all to read it. Okay. So back to not applying bios optimally, this can also happen with our microbials as well. So things like Botanigard, um, other products that contain Bovaria are in Canada are Bioseries, Velifer, or MET52, which is a different um, fungus, uh, but they all have the same characteristics. Um, and that's that they're alive and we need to uh, store them properly. Um, and I already showed you this video, this whole spray to glisten, but it's worth maybe like another quick watch of just seeing how you want to kind of use this yeah. cloud it of okay. um, it on this one here. Nope. Okay. Uh, spores that land just gently wanted him to spray on the plants the key. and also Dust in uh, the a form of cloud that goes underneath and gets on the underside as well. Um, it also doesn't use as much product as a like spray to wrap. And it's actually really quick. Um, this grower sprays weekly, sometimes twice weekly in the really summer, quick. because this guy running up and down the road, like this whole compartment is Ooh. done in less than half an hour. And this grower actually, um, for their thrips management program, a lot of years, they're able to get away with just these Botanic Guard applications and these large mass trapping cards you see here. And I th and it not mites, no mites, um, except for I think in propagation, uh, dipping, um, and then some mites. Uh, and I think that's literally because they're doing such a good job with their botanic garden sprays that it's really highly effective. And then the, the mass trapping cards are taking care of any thrips moving or flying in. Oops, oops, that video just wants to keep playing. Um, the last place where thrips failures can happen is when we make assumptions. I am guilty of this as much as anyone else, but they know what they say about assumptions. Um, so this whole strategy we've come up with for thrips, um, what thrips are we talking about? I mean, we've been assuming we're talking about Western flower thrips, right? That's the only thrips we've got in Ontario floriculture greenhouses. Well, that turned out not to be so true. So something happened around 2012, uh, Mike Short here, he's met, um, as well as my predecessor, Graham Murphy, started noticing something odd. Um, they would notice these plants that had heavily clustered foliar damage. So there wouldn't necessarily be that much damage on the flowers, but you get these really hard hit uh, plants um, with even just like not zooming in, you can see how much damage is on the plant. The other weird thing they were seeing is on monitoring cards, um, there weren't that many thrips, certainly not enough that you should be seeing that much damage on your plants. So it became a bit of a head scratcher. And I think it was um, one of them anyway, first suggested that maybe we have a different thrip species, um, which is kind of all the, the first place you should go when something weird is happening is IDing your pest. So um, this job fell to the new person, of course. <laughs> they were like, hey, Sarah, you've been here six months. Why don't you do this? <laughs> oh, who are you pointing at? <laughs> like, yep, her, not me. Um, so I did a survey with my summer students of um, eight large floriculture operations with a whole bunch of different crops to just see what was out there in the landscape. Uh, so here's how you, 
tap a plant to get thrips off of it so you can look at the different life stages and to catch them if you ever want need to ID them. Oh, it is wait, eh, play video play. No. Maybe I just put in a picture, not a video. I thought it was a video. Anyway, you just boop the plant on the head and uh, gently so you don't knock off the flowers into a white pan. And then we collected the thrips from there and we ID'd them. We also sent them to Ottawa to confirm our IDs because even though I'm an entomologist, I'm not really um, a systematicist, which is next level entomology. So what did we find? Um, we found that 65% of thrips found in floriculture greenhouses were Western flower thrips, but we found that a whopping 33%, which was kind of unexpected, were onion thrips. And then we had a smattering of other thrips species. So this really was kind of a shocker. Um, the onion thrips in yellow pictured here did seem pretty segregated by certain crops. Uh, Gerbera had the most, um, chrysanthemum was next, but we would see them in things like geranium and impatience. And since then, um, now that we're aware of them, we know what to look for. Mike and Graham and I have found them um, heavy outbreaks in crops like osteospermum, greenhouse herbs, cyclamen, gluxinia, and cannabis. And I've also been in touch with Suzanne Wainwright in the States. Some of you know her as Bug Lady uh, in Bug Lady Consulting and asked her if she's seeing the same thing and she completely is and she um, uses a lot of our tools to ID thrips now that she's aware of the issue. So it really is a widespread problem. Um, so it comes back to that basic insect identification that Mike was talking about with aphids. You know, we do this for aphids and white flies and mites. Why aren't we doing it for thrips? Um, so we tried to solve this problem by creating an easy identification key for growers because insect identification can be very difficult. Um, so we wanted to make something that it was totally possible for IPM practitioners and consultants like Suzanne and Mike and even on farm IPM people to use. So it does require a microscope because you need to go up to a magnification of around 40. Um, but other than that, it's based on some pretty uh, like pronounced characteristics. So like we drew little cartoons. So like the hairs on their shoulders are, are big indicators as are their eye spots, their primitive eye spots. These are, uh, they sense light ra rather than see like their normal eyes. So if you're interested in looking at this tool, which I have to say has been uh, grower approved. We've done it in workshops. We've lent the key out to growers. They all say they can use it no problem. Um, this is under the additional resources tab on the On Floriculture blog. And just, if this seems intimidating, here's a picture of what the thrips actually look like under the microscope at 40, 40 times magnification. So Western flower thrips have red ocelli, those eye spots. Onion thrips have gray. You can see the difference. When they're red, they're very red. When they're gray, it sort of just looks like the thrips got hit in the head a little bit on the forehead. So they're not like three really gray spots, but it's a little gray like. And then you can see this hair factor. So onion thrips don't, don't have a hairy, this is the, called the pronotum on the thrips, but essentially it's the shoulders. They don't have hairy shoulders. Um, Western flower thrips looks like it needs to go for a wax job. So it's pretty easy to tell them apart. It's, it, I don't want anyone to be intimidated by this. Um, so why does this matter? Well, it's because we know that biocontrol programs that we've developed for Western flower thrips, like the one I've showed you here, are not working for onion thrips. So one of the reasons Graham and Mike first noticed this phenomenon is not just that heavy pattern of feeding and the lack of thrips on the card, but also it was people with really solid biocontrol programs that were failing and they were having this thrips overload that they couldn't explain. So, um, we got a grad student on it, which is what you do when there's too many questions to answer. And her job is to figure out, first of all, where are these onion thrips coming from? Which part of this IPM program that we've developed are not effective for onion thrips and which part work for onion thrips? And how can we change maybe this infographic or this program to work for multiple thrip species at once? And the, she's just started in 2019, so we don't have all the answers. But we do know some things so far. So in terms of where they come from, we know for sure that onion thrips do not come in on mum cuttings. So they're most likely flying in from outside. And we did this by um, checking the cuttings by washing them 
and from a whole bunch of different suppliers across the country. And then we also put up sticky cards um, for a full year to inside and outside the greenhouse. So following that sticky card stuff that we were using to figure out where they were from, we were also able to use that information to figure out which color they prefer. And like the Western flower thrips testing I did before, they like yellow better generally. But the interesting thing about the cards and um, the onion thrips that goes back to what Graham and Mike were observing is that, um, so in the spring and in the fall, these two bars represent, this is the number of thrips in the crop, in the green bar. The yellow bar is the number of the, of the proportion of thrips on the sticky card. So you can see that they're pretty even. We've got, you know, when we do plant taps proportionally, we see around 50% of onion thrips in the crop and we've got, you know, 30 to 50% uh, onion thrips on the cards. And this is true in autumn as well, where they almost perfectly match. In the summer, this relationship doesn't hold up. What we end up seeing is a ton of onion thrips in the crop and none going to the cards. And we don't really know what that is about. <laughs> I, I honestly, we don't know. We don't know if the light intensity changes and those yellow cards become less attractive. Um, Ashley's also looked at white cards. But what that really means is that monitoring cards, they might work in the spring and the fall, but they're not gonna be reliable for you in the summer to figure out whether you've got Western flower thrips or onion thrips. And you can ID the thrips from the cards, I should say. You wanna wrap them in saran wrap first so your microscope doesn't get sticky because that would be bad. But you can see the same features on thrips that are um, the right side up on the card anyway. Um, the other thing Ashley has done is predation studies. So looking at all the different predators we already use in IPM programs for thrips and seeing if there's a choice, you know, like seeing if the reason onion thrips is out of control is because none of the predators like it. And that turned out not to be true. All the predators will eat it. Um, but it turns out that Swirskii eats the highest amount of onion thrips than any of the other mites. So that really explains why we were seeing a lot of failures in operations that were relying mostly on cucumerous uh, for their thrips control. So she's still working on things like botanigard and um, other things that might help. Um, but the other things that we do know is that pesticides do work against onion thrips. They don't have the same level of resistance as Western flower thrips. And that's because probably because they're not coming in on cuttings from other facilities, they're coming in from outside, whether that be weeds or onion fields or hay fields, who the heck knows. So the pesticides we've seen work well against them are belief, um, success, contos, avid, and ferrets will definitely give you good suppression. The problem is, um, that's great, they do work. If someone's got a problem or needs to spot spray, we, we can tackle it, but what we, what we don't want is growers resorting back to diagnostic sprays. Like if you've suddenly got a thrips problem that's out of control, you think your bio program isn't working, so you decide to spray just to see if it's onion thrips. I don't think that's the way to go because most of the chemicals that we know work for onion thrips also disrupt mite-based programs for Western flower thrips. So we know that pesticides like Conto, Success, Avid, and even DDVP have lethal and sublethal effects on predatory mites. So you'd really be throwing your Western flower thrips program out of whack. Um, we also know that DDVP, uh, like even when you fog it, um, can go through the sachets and kill the mites inside the sachets. So you might think you're doing something that has like a pretty low residual that you can get away with, but it's just not compatible with, with mites and sachets. Um, Ferrance is compatible with predatory mites, but beyond the problem of it only offers suppression rather than control is you can potentially disrupt bios for other pests. So things like, you know, it's hard on Dolphastis, it might be hard on parasitoids. And beyond all that, onion thrips is a thrips and it has very high potential for resistance. So there's people who spend their whole career studying onion thrips in field onions and really struggle against this resistance issue. So to think we could just go back to spraying for this a pest like this is just gonna lead to problems. So really all we can recommend right now, um, <laughs> until this project is done, is consider, consider changing up your program in May when onion thrift starts to fly. And 
the first step of that is to just be more observant. So stop and ID your threats if things seem a little off. And how do you do that? You want to use plant taps and actually collect the threats or take your, um, so your sticky cards won't work in the middle of the summer. And then you want to use the ID key that I've mentioned. And then I've come up with these rough thresholds that I feel like I've seen based on commercial operations. So, um, this isn't, you know, uh, a scientific fact. It's more of my gut feeling. So take it or leave it. But um, it's time to do something if you've got around 30 to 40 percent of your thrips population is onion thrips, or if you're noticing pockets of heavy foliar damage. So the greenhouses where I've really seen them enter a problem where they need to do a major spray or even just clean out their whole compartment are the growers who got to sort of 60 to 70 percent onion thrips in their population. So by the time you're at 30 to 40, you need to probably do something. Uh, and do what? So the first would be to switch to Swirsky Eye over Cucumerus, but that might take a while. Uh, probably add Aureus, because it really doesn't hurt to have something that eats adults. And consider spot sprays of pesticides um, before bud formation. But again, not everywhere. You don't want to wipe out um, your Western flower with rips. Uh, bio program. So this is the best we have to offer so far. Stay tuned on the blog. Hopefully we'll have better information. Um, so back to the blog for a second. You can also search by category. So if you just want to see all the posts that I've done on grips, uh, you can do that on the menu if you scroll down on the left. And that's all I've got for this one.